Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, please be seated. That's good. We are in the sixth week of Epiphany, and if you've been keeping track, you realize that over the course of this season, the scriptures sort of point toward Jesus revealing himself little by little, or Jesus being revealed to the world in new ways little by little. You probably remember last week. Please say you remember the sermon last week. If you do, you remember that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, was written to show how Jesus was not some new flash in the pan, some new fangled fad of a religion, not some religious novelty. But Jesus had roots. Jesus wasn't a new thing, wasn't doing away with the law and the prophets, but was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That's important for Matthew. But when he said that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, that was just a starting point for him. That's where we pick up. So now we get to the Sermon on the Mount, and if you're keeping track, that's about chapter 5 in Matthew. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has pulled his disciples up and he's teaching them. And he starts to show his disciples that it's not just revealing who he is, but it's revealing who they are, who they're going to be. And he wants to move them beyond this conventional understanding of righteousness. The fulfillment of righteousness means you don't just stop with the conventional understanding. You complete it. And so he says, you know, the regulations that people have been following all along, more or less, those simply are not sufficient for a mature faith. It's like in the letter of Paul, where he's talking and he says, you know, you're like infants. Those rules are like the milk for an infant. And you know what? It's time to grow up. We can't just follow the law as it is written. We have to have the law written in our hearts. If we're going to do, yeah, if we're going to really know God, that's how we have to be. Unfortunately, growing up means dealing with uncomfortable and unclear things. The older I get, the more I know that I have no idea what's going on. And that's exactly where we are today in the Gospel. Jesus starts off with these very odd things, and the disciples have to be sitting there saying, I have no idea what you're saying, Jesus. This makes no sense at all. They are outrageously wild things. Extreme. But of course, we've been around long enough to know that Jesus loves to push the envelope. He loves to sort of throw out these extreme examples and then say, now let's think about that. In a way, I think Jesus, when he throws out these extremes, it's his way of saying, we're not just tinkering around with our faith here, guys. This is serious business and it's meant not to just add a little doodads here and there to your faith, It is meant to change everything about how you live. And so he says, you have heard it said, don't murder. But I say to you, whoever is angry at a brother or sister or says, you fool, will be liable to the judgment and the hell of fire. 
How crazy does that sound? Whoever is angry at someone is guilty of the same thing as murder? But Jesus isn't done. He goes on, he says, You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lust is guilty of adultery. And then he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Don't divorce. And do not swear an oath. Think about what he's saying there. That's some crazy stuff. Especially because when you look at that list, that's essentially stuff that most people do every day. Can you think of a day when you didn't get angry at someone? We regularly notice how other people look. And we take oaths an amazing amount of time. Sometimes because we have to. And sometimes we just say, I swear. I swear to you. And where do we even begin with this whole eye-plucking and hand-chopping stuff? Can you imagine being the disciples? Remember, these are young guys. Having your teachers say, oh yeah, you know, if you sin, cut your, you know, pluck out your eye. And I can just imagine the disciples looking at each other saying, here he goes again. We're in this really wild land. But Jesus never does this without a purpose, does he? And one of the things about pushing things to the extreme, the way he does, is that he pushes them to the breaking point. He pushes them to a point where they say, this can't work. Like later on in chapter 19, when Jesus is talking about how it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven, and Peter says, Lord, well, who then can be saved? And you could almost see Jesus saying, finally you get it. Because for people it's impossible. But for God, nothing is impossible. You have to depend on God's grace and on God's mercy. This is much earlier in the whole teaching process for Jesus, but he's still pushing them. But don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus isn't serious when he says, anger at your neighbor leads to murder. For him... Anger is as serious as murder. Holding on to that anger. Because it is, when you think about it, at the heart of much murder. Much violence. It's almost like saying that murder is a symptom of an extreme case of anger. And it starts with a simple, you fool. That contempt, that anger, is the breakdown of a relationship and the refusal to step back and to reflect on what's more important. Is the relationship more important? Or is being right more important? Is getting your way more important? And if we think being right is more important, then we have to reflect on the fact that most of us just aren't that smart. And a lot of the time when we think we're right, we're not. So maybe the relationship has more value. And then we get to the adultery question. Jesus is, is trying to get his disciples to see what lies behind the act of adultery itself. Behind the act of cheating on your partner. He says there's a lot more to that. If you're going to be an adult, you can't just look at the surface. There are layers here. And Jesus says something 
is going on before you ever get to that act. And he uses the word lust, which is an interesting word because it suggests something that is even worse than the act. It suggests the objectification of another person. Seeing another person as an object that I get to exploit. Seeing another person as a thing. That's what lust indicates. Now, back in the old days, in the 80s, when I was in seminary, we had to go and be intern chaplains, and I happened to be uh, have my internship at Bellevue Hospital. And we all had to gather every day with our mentor. Our mentor was this old Mennonite pastor. And every week, we would have this reflection on a scripture, and he would, he would basically preach to us about a passage. And one week, he was preaching to us, or talking to us, He sort of sat in his chair with his arm over the back of the chair like this and said, well... And so we get to this gospel passage one day and he he sort of leans back in the chair and says, well, there's nothing wrong with appreciating the outward beauty of another person. It's quite natural. And in and of itself, that is not lust. Appreciation is appreciation. Lust is seeing only the external, the sexual, and refusing to see the actual person. Lust is turning a person into an object to possess. And it's that lust which is at the heart of broken relationships. It's interesting that it's right after the discussion of adultery that Jesus brings up the whole idea of plucking out your eye or cutting off your hand. I don't know if that placement was intentional or not, but what was intentional was mentioning that it is the right eye and the right hand. Because in that culture, the right is the seat of power. And good. The right hand is a hand of blessing. So when he says, take out the right eye, cut off the right hand, that is as as drastic as it gets. Again, he's pushing the extremes, right? And it's not because Jesus ever intends for his disciples to pluck out any eyes or cut off any hand. If every time somebody sinned, they cut out an eye or a hand, we would be in a really bad condition right now. Every one of us. What he's doing is once again stressing how impossible it is to follow the law to the letter. But that's also not what he's calling us to do. Grace and mercy are always possible for God, so we can trust in that. What Jesus is interested in us doing is living the intent of the law, embodying the spirit of the law, understanding that at the root of the law is the relationship, and that it's the relationship in all these things that we hold far more dear than an eye or a hand or our status or money. Because if we're going to be followers of Christ, relationship is at the heart of everything we do. There is nothing more important. So when Jesus talks about divorce, It's talking about relationship. And that is radical for Jesus' day. Because we have to understand the context of divorce then. Marriage in those days in that part of the world was not the same thing we think of as today. 
Marriage was a business transaction. A woman was utterly dependent on her husband to survive, to stay alive. And she was little more than a piece of property for her husband. He didn't have to love him. He had to obey. And what's more, in that time, divorce wasn't the same thing we have today. There were no lawyers. The husband just wrote a certificate of divorce and said, you're out of here. And she was gone. Which was almost as good as a death sentence because it was really hard to survive if you were a divorced woman. In those days, in marriage, you could have good marriages, absolutely. But it's also true that a human being could very easily be discarded like so much refuse. So what Jesus is saying today is that his followers are to treat no person as disposable. He's saying that marriage is more than a business transaction, but it is, in fact, a relationship. And then, as we get through this long list of things that Jesus is saying, he's really troubling the disciples by now, and they're all saying, what is he doing? Then he gets to swearing oaths. Well, swearing oaths are sort of a righteous thing in a lot of ways, certainly at that time. People would swear upon their father's grave. They would swear that they would do something and they would expect to do it. It was common practice. But Jesus says, anything more than your yes or your no comes from the evil one. And again, he's sort of throwing them in a tizzy. What does he mean by that? Why would he say that? Why not let somebody swear an oath and keep the oath? What he's saying here is to let your words be your bond, as it were. Let your words, let you intend what you say. Treat your word to another as if it were the very relationship itself. Don't just swear. Live it. We live in a pretty legalistic society and you know that we have to sign contracts all the time and sometimes we have to swear oaths, especially if you're a public servant. Fine. But in relationships, swearing does not make you more trustworthy or more loving. People can say, oh, I swear, I swear, I really do. That doesn't make you more believable. What Jesus is saying is your words aren't going to be what make you more trustworthy. The way you behave and the way you treat others will. So all of these extremes that Jesus brings to the disciples in today's lesson are simply ways of saying, I want you to do more than follow the law. I want you to embody it. I want you to be filled with the spirit of the law. I want you to live the intent of the law. And we know what the intent of the law of God is because it has always been the same. It is and always has been and always will be to hold each other up so that we all, together, might become the community of God's love. Amen.